Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. We have an important show for you tonight. If you'd like to comment, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Lots to cover. Let's get started. Despite ongoing COVID woes and their military aggression toward Taiwan, Communist China is set to host the Winter Olympics on February 4th. They also continue to persecute Christians and religious minorities within their own borders. The United States and other nations will compete under what they call a diplomatic boycott. But what does that really mean? With perspective on all of this is the president of Women's Rights Without Frontiers, Reggie Littlejohn, and the president of the Population Research Institute and author of Bully of Asia, Stephen Mosier. Thank you both for being here. Uh, first, Steve, with China's open aggression towards Taiwan this past weekend, I mean, they sent 39 warplanes into Taiwan's airspace uh, on Sunday. President Xi has continuously made it clear that the Chinese Communist Party views Taiwan as part of its territory. What is the purpose of these incursions? And do you think they're timed with the Russian actions occurring in and around Ukraine? Well, it would be surprising if they weren't timed, uh, if, if Xi and Putin weren't talking about what to do in terms of joint action to, to force the United States to deal with two crises at once. The, the ongoing incursions are clearly intended to demoralize the population of Taiwan and to show them that over the long run that they can't possibly stand up to giant communist China. I think that's false, by the way. I think uh, opinion polls in Taiwan show that uh, three quarters of the population says it would take up arms and fight if China actually launched an invasion of the island. The people in Taiwan enjoy mm -hmm. human rights. They enjoy freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of association. Uh, they do not want to be uh, subjected to the same, uh, you know, co corruption and oppression that we now see in Hong Kong, uh, just a couple of hundred mm -hmm. miles away from Taiwan. Yeah. The U.S. and Japanese navies put on a show of force in the Philippine Sea. Does China get the message, Steve? And, and what do you expect to see vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? Well, you know, Stalin said uh, uh, decades ago that, 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 that he likes to probe uh, his enemies and see if the, uh, they meet mush or steel. And if they meet mush, they continue to probe, they continue to advance. And if they meet steel, then they retreat. Well, we've got now two aircraft carriers uh, doing maneuvers, uh, carrier battle groups in the South China Sea. That's several hundred thousand tons of steel uh, armed with uh, several, uh, you know, hundred planes that are very effective warfighting weapons. So I think that's a great deterrent right there. It's a signal to Xi uh, to keep his hands off Taiwan and, in fact, to retreat from his claims uh, to seize the South China Sea. I don't think anything is going to happen until after the Olympics because they wouldn't want to upset the apple cart, as it were. They want a great celebration uh, uh, showing China's success in, in athletic endeavors before perhaps trying to show their success in military endeavors. I want to play something for you. This is Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman at a virtual think tank event on Wednesday regarding Putin's timing over a possible invasion of Ukraine. Listen. We certainly see. Uh, every indication uh, that he is going to use military force uh, sometime, uh, perhaps now and uh, middle of February. Uh, we all are aware that the Beijing Olympics begin on February 4th, the opening ceremony, and uh, President Putin expects to be there. I, I think that probably uh, uh, President Xi Jinping would not be ecstatic if uh, Putin chose that moment to invade Ukraine. Uh, so that may affect his timing and his thinking. Stephen, what do you make of Sherman's comments? And remember, Russia invaded Georgia in 2008 during the Summer Olympics. That took place in Beijing. In, in Beijing, yeah. Uh, the world would be distracted, certainly, by the Olympic Get Winter Olympics in Beijing. And, but, but also, there's a timetable here uh, with regard to the invasion of both Taiwan and the Ukraine. Uh, when the weather starts to warm and the snow starts to melt, you know, those T-72 Soviet tanks aren't very much good on boggy, muddy ground. So they've only got a few more weeks to move if they're going to move. Mm. Uh, in the mm. case of Taiwan, you have to have calm weather on the Taiwan Straits to get an invading army across. Otherwise, it will be sunk in the Taiwan Straits and slaughtered on the beaches. And, and my view of both uh, 
Raymond, is that we should arm the Ukrainians and the people of Taiwan. And, and if we arm them, they will fight for their freedom. There's no need to shed American blood. Hmm, interesting. Uh, I want to move on to these Beijing Olympic Games. Uh, I want to bring Reggie Littlejohn in. Reggie, uh, you've been very outspoken that the U.S. should have boycotted these games because of China's human rights record. Is this diplomatic boycott enough? And does that have any impact at all? Well, Raymond, the, the, we, we have called these the genocide games. China's human rights atrocities are horrific, including forced abortion, forced sterilization, infanticide, uh, interning Uyghur Muslims, all of this aimed at destroying the Uyghur people. And a diplomatic boycott is absolutely not enough. And I testified before the U.S. Congress last May that we should be, and Chris Smith with me, that we should be moving the games. Now it's too late to move the games. And we should. And so what I would say is, I, I worry about the Olympic athletes even going to Beijing. They're having a COVID outbreak oh. there. They're gonna be under mass surveillance. Um, and I don't know whether any of them are thinking that they will say something about the uh, human rights atrocities from Chinese soil, but if they do, I think that they would be endangering themselves. So the whole thing is just a mess, and we at the genocidegames.org, that's a website that I have co-authored, co um, are calling mm -hmm. on uh, the U.S. Olympics Committee to encourage U.S. athletes not to attend for their own safety. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Dur during an interview on CNN this past Sunday, broadcaster Bob Costas, who's anchored many of these Olympic Games, said this about the International Olympic Committee awarding the Games to China. Listen. The IOC deserves all of the disdain and disgust that comes their way for going back to China yet again. They were in Beijing in 2008. They go to Sochi in 2014. They're shameless about this stuff. The IOC awarded the games to China in 2015, and since then, we have seen the genocide of the Uyghur Muslims, repression in Hong Kong, stricter restrictions on religious freedom, repression in Ta Tibet, increased aggression toward Taiwan. Reggie, why did the IOC look past the ongoing repression and abuses in the country, in the mainland, and allow the Chinese this moment of honor and, and moment on the world stage? I would agree that this is completely disgraceful, and it was predictable, because after the, the 2008 games, China, Chinese human rights deteriorated. So what made—and that was after China promised to improve their human rights. Mm -hmm. So what made them think that they were going to improve this time? You know, Raymond, this is very much like the 1936 games in Berlin, the Nazi Olympics. Uh, except it's even worse, because in 1936, we did not know what the Nazis were about to do. We know mm -hmm. now what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. So we are all the more responsible, and the IOC is mm -hmm. all the more responsible. And after uh, after the, uh, the Olympics in Beijing, I am worried that they will invade Taiwan, like Hitler did after the 1936 case, it, it, it invaded Poland. They use Poland, they, these yeah. totalitarian regimes. They 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 use the Olympics as a way of legitimating themselves so that they can take their horrid, horrid totalitarian actions. Hmm. Steve, what do you uh, make of Costas's comments? And it, I, I keep hearing this argument: if we include China in the community of nations, we can help reshape them. It sounds like the old Bush doctrine with trade with China. You know, if we trade with them, they'll absorb our values. That doesn't seem to be working, Steve. No, it hasn't worked since it's been tried for four decades, and it, it right. obviously that dog doesn't hunt. I mean, at some point, we have to give up the notion that China is going to become like us, and we have to start fighting not to become like them, which is a topic for another day. But, you know, I have to tell you, Raymond, another reason not to go to Beijing, we really don't know what communicable disease is spreading in China these days. It, it does seem mm. unlikely to be that 
China's communist leaders would lock down entire cities because of Omicron, which is pronounced I'm a cold, which generally produces only mild symptoms. I mean, do we have some new variant of the COVID virus? There are rumors out of China of some new pathogen, a hemorrhagic fever, perhaps. The only thing we can be sure of is that Chinese officials will continue to mislead us about what's happening in China, just as they have from the beginning of the COVID pandemic. So why would we put our athletes at risk of contracting a new variant or worse yet of bringing it back to our shores by sending them to Beijing. People need to know that there's only one country that's really boycotting the Olympics, and that is North Korea. Believe it or not, China's only ally, which sits right there across the Yalu River from North China, where they have this new epidemic, has said, we're not sending our athletes to China because of this new pandemic. What do they know in Pyongyang that we don't know? Very good insight. That is, that is amazing, and I think you're right. NBC, by the way, the media outlet covering the Olympics announced this week much of its Beijing Olympics team would be covering the games from Stamford, Connecticut, due to COVID. But there's also the reality that the Chinese government censors the media. Steve, is it typical to discuss the politics of the host country, and do you expect we'll see it at these games? Well, it obviously is typical to discuss everything about the host country. The language, the culture, the setting of the Olympics is, is background, right? That's all B-roll material, and it comes up frequently. <laughs> Except in this case, we're not going to see anything about the carefully snow-covered, outside the carefully snow-covered <laughs> slopes. The rest of the slopes, of course, being barren of snow altogether. And so it's right. all going to be contrived. It's all going to be a giant Potemkin village. And I'll tell you what. The, the Olympics is a celebration of the human spirit. It's about seeing uh, what individual athletes can, can, can be, the best that they can be in whatever it is, the Giants saw them or whatever. But in this case, it's all stage managed. And, and as for me, they can broadcast it until the cows come home. Uh, they can't force me to watch it, just like they can't force me to buy products made in China, just like they can't force me to stop talking about the persecution of Catholics in China and other religious minorities. I'm going to continue to speak up. Um, they can broadcast the games, but they can't make us watch them. Mm. If media is worried about COVID, uh, Reggie, and you raised this a minute ago, why are we sending our athletes there? I mean, do you expect to hear anything about China's human rights abuses during these games from NBC? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, you know, I, I, and also not from the athletes, not from any, any media. So mm -hmm. we are going to have to rely on people like you and on people who are not in the legacy media to tell the truth about what's going on in Beijing, because everything there is incredibly um, enclosed. The, the athletes, the journalists, the staff, everybody's going to be in this bubble, and they're not going to be allowed to come outside of this bubble. That's the yeah. Olympic bubble. And God forbid well, anybody who's inside of that bubble tries to say something about the human rights in China because they are in the power of the Chinese Communist Party, and who knows what will happen to them. And I have not seen any plan by the IOC or by the United States know. government what they're going to do if somebody actually protests human rights in China. Well, there's a report published by the University of Toronto's Research and Strategic Policy Unit, Citizen Lab, it's called, and they found that the My 2022 app, which is mandatory for all the competing athletes in Beijing to use, has a flaw. The app is used to monitor athletes' health, their travel data, but an encryption flaw leaves files and media vulnerable to hacking, and it has a list of politically sensitive words that have been marked for censorship. Steve, the Chinese must be loving this. Oh, absolutely. Uh, my friend Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, uh, just put out that uh, Team USA is telling our athletes, uh, Raymond, to use burner phones and to avoid, right. su avoid surveillance by the Chinese Communist Party. I don't know how you can avoid surveillance by the Chinese Communist Party when you're in China, because you'll be tailed and surveilled and watched. And you have to be careful what you say and where you go and who you talk to, not just because you might get arrested and get in trouble, but because you might get those people you have contact with in China arrested as well. So that's what we've been having to do for the last 20 years in China. You, you don't take your iPhone. Uh, you don't take your, your, your phone to China. You get a burner phone uh, that you use there and then throw away because they're watching, they're listening, they're surveilling everybody all the time 
in 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 real time. So you know, if you have to use a burner phone when visiting a country, why on earth are you visiting that country in the first place? Right. It's a great point. And then why are you giving them trillions, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars and supporting them to build venues and then broadcast this uh, event with fireworks and uh, beautiful lights to the rest of the world to make it seem like all is normal when they're the most regressive and, and oppressive regime on the planet. Reggie, you've been outspoken about the negative impacts of these vaccine passports. Recently writing in an op-ed, uh, that likened the vaccine passport to China's social credit system, which monitors citizens' medical, job, social history, and can reward or punish those citizens based on how they behave. I is this athlete's app merely an extension of that mindset, and should athletes be using it? Well, now, this is really interesting, uh, Raymond, because in China, they have a health pass that is related to the social credit score. It's all of the stuff is surveilled, and then they have this health pass. It can be either green, which means that you can move freely, yellow or red. And this is a way that they actually trap dissidents. All they have to do is move their health pass from green to yellow or red, and then the dissident is paralyzed. And God forbid mm. these health passes in the Olympic Village that they could move the health passes of people who might be top Olympic contenders to yellow or red, and all of a sudden, they are not able to compete. And of course, China takes wow. gold. I mean, that's one, one thought. Wow. Yeah, no, no, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, both personal uh, information that, that is going to be seeded here, health records, travel records, uh, the, uh, all the documentation, it's all on that app. Why you would submit that into the ether for China to poach, I don't understand. And you're right. Uh, unlike competition in the United States or another Western country, there is no guarantee this is going to be fair. Now, during his Wednesday audience, Steve, uh, Pope Francis this week had this to say ahead of Holocaust Remembrance Day. He said, it is necessary to remember the extermination of millions of Jews and people of different nationalities and religious faiths. This unspeakable cruelty must never be repeated. It must not be forgotten so that we can build a future where human dignity is no longer trampled underfoot. Now, sadly, Steve, the cruelty is being repeated. It's happening today in China. How is the Vatican still so silent about what's going on there? Uh, the Vatican has been silent about protecting and preserving freedom in Hong Kong. It has been silent about China's aggression towards Taiwan, where there are uh, a million Catholics living and lots and lots of Christians as well. And it has been silent about the destruction of Catholic churches, Christian churches in China, and about the ongoing slow-rolling genocide of the Uyghurs. I mean, I don't think we can talk enough about what's happening to this Turkish-speaking people who have been on, mm -hmm. on that plot of land for thousands of years, where the husbands, the family, heads of household are being locked up by the millions, where the wives and small children have soldiers mm -hmm. and policemen billeted with them, sleeping in the same beds, where we have the older children taken off, put in boarding schools, and only allowed to call home to their mommy for a half an hour once a month, and only taught in the Han Chinese language, not taught in their native language of Turkish. And then you have the young people sold in batches of 100 to factories on the coast of China, making goods for export. I mean, this is carefully calculated. We know that it comes from Xi Jinping himself, because we have a speech dating back from 2013, which he talks about homogenizing the Chinese population. And all minorities are being attacked, but none so viciously and, and none so genocidally, if I can use that word, as the Uyghurs in the far West. And, and I hope that the Pope, the, who has tremendous moral authority, would speak out on this issue. Um, I mean, I know why the current occupant of the White House doesn't speak out. I mean, he's afraid to blame China, because he and his family are so compromised by Beijing. There have been so many sweetheart deals. So Biden doesn't want to talk about decoupling our economies. He doesn't want to demand reparations for those who've been killed by COVID. Uh, he is afraid to boycott the Olympics. Instead, they're, they're content in this White House to let China march relentlessly on with their genocide games, despite unleashing a devastating virus on the world. Um, I mean, but the Pope isn't subject to those kinds of restrictions, and, and I pray that he will speak out in the future. Reggie, I'll give you the last 30 seconds. 
Well, when we talk about the Olympic Games, I believe that not only should uh, we be boycotting them, I believe that in the future, and even in the present games, that they should be delayed and moved, even at this late date. Uh, and actually, that China should be banned from the Olympic Games. You know, the South Africa was banned for more than 20 years because of apartheid. Shouldn't China be banned because of genocide? Yes. Mm. We will leave it there. For more on the work of Reggie Littlejohn, visit Women's Rights Without Frontiers. Dot org. And Bully of Asia by Stephen Mosier is a must-read. It's available at bookstores everywhere and online. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. This past Sunday, Pope Francis officially installed lay women and men into the ministries of lector and catechist. Now, during Mass at St. Peter's Basilica, Francis conferred these ministries to a diverse group of men and women from South Korea, Pakistan, the Amazon, and other locales. And the administrative actions of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, while Archbishop of Munich, is at the center of a controversial German sex abuse report. Here to unpack these stories and more, I'm joined by liturgical expert and author of the new book, Ministers of Christ, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, and priest of the Diocese of Assisi and Vatican consultant for CBS, Monsignor Anthony Figueredo. Thank you both for being here. Peter, I want to start with you. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, Pope Francis bestowed on uh, these ministries, rather, of lector and catechist on lay women for the first time. You have a new book on this subject, Ministers of Christ. Uh, in it, you write the following. Pope Francis's decision by means of his motu proprio, Spiritus Domini, to modify canon law so that the ministries of lector and acolyte are now to be conferred upon women, raises more numerous and far deeper issues than may be apparent to many at first sight. These roles concern the execution of the liturgy and were, on that account, reserved to men. Um, tell me, uh, Dr. Kwasniewski, what exactly has the Pope done here? Yes. Thank you, Raymond. So the, the reason why it, the issues are bigger than they appear at first is that, for, of course, for many decades now, women have been substituting in the Mass as lectors and uh, acolytes, servers. Um, they've been performing okay. a number of these roles that were traditionally reserved to men, um, and therefore, people might scratch their heads and say, what's changed? But what's changed right. is, it is one more kind of rupture, I would say, from tradition. The, the traditional view is that all ministerial offices are clerical. They're all, um, in a sense, uh, there, are, there are ways of representing the work of Christ the priest. Uh, and that's why the church used to ordain men, not just to priesthood, deacon, subdeacon, but also to the minor orders of acolyte, lector, porter, and exorcist. Uh, and so all of these were seen as ways of participating in the priesthood of Christ as God and man, man, true man, a male, you know, so this is part of the symbolism of the priesthood. And there was a kind of echo of that still uh, in the fact that only men could be officially instituted as acolytes and lectors, you know, given a formal liturgical okay. ministry. Um, on, on, on the part of the church. And so what okay. we see here is, you know, Francis, um, and really he's continuing a process that's been going on for some decades of, of viewing liturgical ministries as something that, that, that rise up from baptism spontaneously, a, a kind of immanentism, and not as properly uh, uh, sharing in the, in the ministry, ministry of Christ, the high priest, but as something that simply belongs to the baptized. Um, and I mean, we can, you know, if, if you like, I can make some comments about what, what's problematic in that. Yeah, yeah, we're going to—we'll get to that in a moment, Peter. But, you know, some liturgists and theologians are calling this move historic and long overdue. Uh, they claim this is a continuation of the unfinished work of Vatican II. Uh, Bishop Christopher Coyne of Burlington, Vermont, said, this furthers the notion that lay women and men should be what they should be, assuming their baptismal role, to be the Word of God in the world. Now, Monsignor, were lay people barred from being the Word of God in the world before this past Sunday? 
Well, I don't believe so. Um, certainly, it shouldn't surprise us. Women have long read in the church and have read very well. I, I think the real fear in all of this is that somehow this is a step towards the ordination of women. Let's clear up that mm. point immediately. Pope okay. John Paul II in Ordinatio Sacerdotalis said this is definitive, and Pope Francis himself has said the question is closed. So, in a sense, we're normalizing something that existed for many years already in the church, and this is not a Trojan horse towards women's ordination, Raymond. Hmm. Uh, Peter, uh, very quickly, what is wrong with this, then? Uh, is this your fear that this could matriculate into uh, female ordination because you formally normalized what has been uh, ad hoc practice for a long time in many places? Yes, yes. Well, I mean, unfortunately, as, as Father Peter Stravinskis pointed out in a, in a very fine recent article at Catholic World Report, the record of the past few decades has been a record of continuous disobedience against liturgical law of the church, which was then rewarded by normalizing mm. whatever the disobedient behavior was. Um, and this, he gives about half a dozen examples of this. Communion in the hand is probably the most notorious example. Um, so, yes, I do have fears that this plays into a febrile atmosphere of feminism in the church, which has been there for a long time and has been trying to find every possible way to, you might say, chip away at uh, the domain of, of the priesthood. Um, but, but what I think is really much more fundamentally amiss is that the role of the laity is not to, um, to imitate to ape, as it were, the clergy, but to go out and transform the world outside the church. I mean, even Pope Francis has said that, and Vatican II said it very clearly in Apostolicam Octuositatem, the role of the laity mm -hmm. is not to be mini clerics. Uh, and John Paul II warned against this clericalization of the laity. Um, and, mm. and that's dangerous psychologically because, you know, people should be thinking, what can I do to bring Christ and the church into the world outside? Not how can I volunteer to, you know, hold cruets or read from a book or something like that? And then now I can punch yeah. my religion card. I've done my duty. No, you haven't done your duty. That's the clergy's duty. Divine worship is entrusted to them, right? So yeah. it's well, not just Monsignor made this point. Lady. Last time Monsignor was on, I believe you made the point that it's the, the, it's our job to take the gospel into the world, not to allow the world to influence the gospel. It's, you know, we have it a little backwards here. Uh, in a somewhat related story, Monsignor, I want your take on this, um, because a a as definitive as John Paul was, and, and you mentioned that Pope Francis echoed that uh, clarity on female ordination, the Vatican website for the Synod on Synodality raised some eyebrows for dedicating space to a pro-women's ordination group. On synodresources.org, as you can see here, it's called Women Ordination Conference, Let Her Voice Carry campaign. And you can see on the graphic the reference to ordination justice. Uh, what do you make of ordination justice, Monsignor? Is there such a thing? And, and, and why is this closed issue of women's ordination given pride of place on the synod site? Well, certainly, Raymond, we need to move away from women's ordination, if ever such a thing exists, from an expression of power to one of service. Uh, you know, I've worked at eight different synods at the Vatican, Raymond, and I can tell mm -hmm. you the most re recent synods have produced very, very little. There's a lot of hype. <laughs> there, there's a lot of a noise made, but really what mm -hmm. comes out of it? So I believe that these things are put on the website to cause some sort of uh, justice, so to speak. Let's talk about this. But they amount to very mm. little. They do cause confusion, unfortunately, however, as we're discovering yeah. with LGBT these days. I prefer them not to be on the website, but we shouldn't fear they're not going to amount to very much. This is a definitive teaching, which both Pope mm. John Paul II and Pope Francis have said is definitive and will not change. Peter, I'll give you the last word on this topic before we move on. Yes, I think it, I think what we need to recover is that the highest dignity of the baptized, and this would of course be be for everybody, not just for for the laity, is to receive our Lord Jesus Christ in holy communion. That's our highest dignity. 
um, not to be a minister of this or a minister of that. Uh, and once we recover that same hierarchy of values, and we recognize that we don't have a right to, we don't have a right to the divine life. That's a gift. We don't have a right. No man has a right to the priesthood. That's a divine gift, right? It, it changes the whole way that we that we perceive this this uh, the dynamic here. Mm -hmm. I, I want to move on to what uh, really can only be described as uh, ongoing attacks on traditional Latin mass communities in the wake of uh, the Guardians of the Tradition, that motto proprio by the Pope. In a Commonweal article, Austin Ivory writes, traditionalist enclaves have become hubs of resistance to the very idea of a living tradition. Benedict XVI had not foreseen this when he relaxed the restrictions on the Tridentine Rite in 2007, but it happened, Ivory writes. Um, Monsignor, uh, Ivory and company are attempting, it seems, to turn traditional Catholics into something just this side of January 6th, the insurrectionists. Why the demonization of this ancient form of the liturgy and traditional communities? I honestly don't know, Raymond. My experience is that many good, faithful Catholics love the traditional Latin Mass. They derive great benefit from it, and great fruit is born. You know, we're dealing with two forms of the Roman Rite, and both are subject to exaggerations. I believe, at, at its very best, this phrase from Ivory on uh, havens of resistance to Vatican II may be born mm -hmm. from some websites that uh, seek to polarize and demonize uh, Vatican II and the pontiffs who support it. And that's really unfortunate. And uh, as much as, you know, this is seen as a scorched earth policy of Pope Francis in terms of uh, the extraordinary form, Perhaps some good will come out of it. There's great pain. Perhaps it will lead to rescuing the extraordinary form from, from being a political instrument. And I really hope that it will lead to that cross-pollination of the two forms of the Roman Rite that right. both St. John Paul II and the great Pope Benedict desired. Let's pray for that. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Peter, uh, your reaction here, and Archbishop Arthur Roach, uh, the prefect of the, the uh, Congregation for Divine Worship and Sacraments, told Catholic News Service he believes most bishops are on board with guardians of the tradition and that they greeted the Pope's call back to the Council and also the unity of the Church with open arms, and they're very much behind what the Holy Father is saying. Do you, do you think most bishops agree with the Pope on this? <laughs> I, I think that's 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 wishful thinking on Archbishop Roach's part. He might be telegraphing to people what he wants to be the case. Um, but I mean, I, I, I wrote, by the way, I wrote an article on Robate Cheli about that interview with Bishop Roach, in case anybody's uh, interested in, in, in looking at that. Um, but no, in, in point of fact, what we've seen across the world is what I would describe as a piecemeal implementation of Traditionis Custodes uh -huh. and the responsa uh, from December 18th. It's been in some dioceses, the bishops have, have shown more of an attempt to follow the letter of the law. In other dioceses, bishops have largely dispensed from the provisions. They've all made some show of responding to what the Holy Father is asking for. But sometimes that just means saying, we don't have the problems in our diocese that he's describing, which of course the bishop, the local bishop should know best, oh, his own okay. diocese and what his people okay. you know, are like. I resent the scribblers characterizing with a very broad brush a whole group of people and demonizing them, frankly. Um, th that, that speaks to me of a cruelty, and it just—it doesn't bear, bear out. Look, I occasionally will go to a Latin Mass. I know these people. I've seen these people. They are certainly not hubs of resistance. You know, they're living their lives. They want tradition and quiet, and most of them are too young, frankly, to be resistant to anything. They're just yearning, I think, for a transcendent experience, which they find in the old liturgy. And God willing, that will bleed over to, as Monsignor said, and I think Benedict's vision was, that will bleed into the Novus Ordo as well and, and uh, lift the general sacrality. But 
I don't like this idea of writing people out like Sadducees of the Catholic Church. If that's what they want, that's what's going to happen. And uh, the dollars are going to go with it. I, I hate to say that. Diana Montagna <laughs> is reporting uh, in the, that the Bishop of Venice, Florida, Frank DeWayne, is now forbidding priests in his diocese from celebrating Mass ad orientum facing the East. Um, Monsignor, your thoughts on this? Does the priest have any prerogative here? I mean, um, you know, the, the, it seems the rubrics, even of the new mass, Vatican II, the documents of Vatican II, clearly indicate that the priest is facing east. He's not facing the people. I understand. Certainly there's obedience to one's bishop. But what I find, Raymond, is that uh, where good exists, evil also rears its ugly head. Unfortunately, mm. and uh, these things tend to collapse on their own. And I remember mm. Pope Benedict saying to me once that uh, those things which bear the greatest fruit are done with the, with humility. And um, mm. I believe, you know, through obedience, the extraordinary form will continue to exist, and in an even stronger way in future years. Hmm. Uh, Peter, very quickly, your reaction to this, uh, and, and we see this in Chicago, we see it now in, right. in Naples, and I'm sure we'll see it in other places, yes. the banning of uh, ad orientum facing the East. Right. It's, it's completely ultra vires. It's completely beyond the power of a bishop to contradict the general instruction of the Roman Missal, as well as the, um, the rubrics of, of the Novus Ordo Missal itself, which um, I mean, I, I, this has been demonstrated uh, online in many articles. Uh, if you look carefully, it presupposes that the priest is facing east because it says to him at several points, turn around and say to the people, the Lord be with you. Well, if, uh -huh. if he was already facing the people, then he'd be, you know, pirouetting right in place. It wouldn't make any sense. Right. <laughs> so and, and similarly, there have been clarifications from the Congregation for Divine Worship over the years saying that uh, that, of course, the, the Novus Ordo can be celebrated uh, uh, facing eastwards uh, together with the people mm -hmm. in one common direction um, towards mm -hmm. the symbolic east. And so, I mean, this is, yeah. it shows actually the level of ignorance that we find mm -hmm. of rubrics and of liturgical directives. Yeah, years ago in my interview with Pope Benedict, uh, just before his election, he made this case that, you know, he, he preferred the uh, ad orientum posture, and he laid out a whole host of reasons, and all of it makes great sense. Monsignor Figueredo, I need your take on the latest vis-a-vis uh, -vis this uh, Archdiocese of Munich sex abuse report that seems to fault Archbishop Joseph Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict, for mishandling four cases of abuse when he led the archdiocese from 1977 to 82. Now, the Vatican came to the defense of the retired pope this week, citing Benedict's efforts as the first pope to meet with abuse victims, issuing strong norms to punish offending priests, and seeking forgiveness on behalf of the Church. Uh, Monsignor, Pope Benedict's now 94. Uh, he said he will respond in due times to these findings. Is there anything new in this report? Child abuse and its cover-up is a horrendous crime. It's a crime that uh, cries out for vengeance to heaven. But we need perspective on this, Raymond. You know, we're talking about a pope who took strong action. I remember Ireland. He took strong action in mm -hmm. 2010 in his native Germany. We have a pope who was the first to meet with abuse victim, a pope who has said he will respond to the 1,900-page report. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, mm -hmm. what we are dealing with, as Andrea Torniele did say, that we're dealing with a mm -hmm. scapegoat and we're dealing with summary judgments. In British, we mm -hmm. would say it's a lot of codswallop. Because, quite frankly, we are dealing with a pope who is already doing great penance by praying for the church and the victims of abuse, has given up all the glory of being a pope and is simply spending his life already praying for these victims. Certainly, the, the Holy Father, I mean, we're talking about 74 years were investigated Cardinal Ratzinger was the Archbishop of Munich for four and a half years. And we're dealing with four cases which, quite frankly, are quite questionable. And if one just simply reads what's going on, we know that Pope Francis is being attacked for who he is 
on his firm teachings in other areas, such as morality. We need perspective on this, Raymond. Pope Benedict, and you mean. Certainly you mean Pope we Benedict. don't need absolutely, because Pope Benedict is an intelligent pope, probably one of the most intelligent popes we've had uh, ever. Mm -hmm. He's certainly the humblest pope we've ever had. And I've always witnessed that he will read things very carefully, and when the time is right, he will respond with absolute mm -hmm. clarity and accuracy. Yeah. Let's wait Monsignor. for that. You know, I read a, a statement yeah. today, Raymond. Yeah. Good. I, I think we're in agreement that the, all of this should be made transparent, but I don't think anybody should be left off the hook. And that includes Cardinal Marx in Germany, who also has a checkered record here. Uh, that should be fully exposed and vetted. And there are also cases in Argentina and elsewhere where Pope Francis has, has uh, uh, incidences where he was involved in uh, individuals who were engaged in sexual abuse of minors, et cetera, or seminarians. All of that, all of it should be made transparent so we know where we stand and uh, justice is finally served. Now, the National Catholic Reporter, I want both of your reaction to this before we leave. The National Catholic Reporter is now calling on Benedict to give up his title. We believe, the quote is, that more than an apology is in order, we join the survivors network of those abused by priests, commonly known as SNAP, in calling for Benedict to give up his title as Pope Emeritus, a designation fraught with complications even before these allegations of abuse cover up. Perhaps he should also stop wearing the white cassock normally reserved for popes. Peter and then Monsignor, your reaction. I, 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 th I think then we, we need to call him Pope Emeritus Emeritus. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an odd title. Monsignor, your take. Pope Benedict is also already giving the greatest example a pope can give, which is to pray for the church, to pray for the victims of abuse. He's already leading a life of penance of his own volition. And quite frankly, mm -hmm. that's what the church needs. I'm pretty sure, too, Raymond, he's praying for his enemies and his persecutors. Mm. Well, we shall leave it there. Gentlemen, I thank you. Monsignor Anthony Figueredo, uh, thanks for joining us from London this evening. Uh, and the book, Ministers of Christ, Recovering the Roles of Clergy and Laity in an Age of Confusion by Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, is available online and at bookstores everywhere. Thank you both. Last week, the Supreme Court agreed to hear an appeal by a former high school football coach who was suspended and later fired for his refusal to stop praying on the field after games. Now, the Supreme Court took up the appeal after a lower court ruling rejected the coach's claims that the school district's actions violated his First Amendment rights to free speech and religious freedom. Joining me exclusively to discuss this case is the former coach of Bremerton High School in Washington State, Joseph Kennedy, and special counsel for litigation and communications for the First Liberty or First Liberty, rather, representing Coach Joe, Jeremy Dice. Thank you both for being here. Joe, uh, you served as an assistant football coach at your alma mater, Bremerton, from uh, 2008 to 2015. You made a promise to God that, win or lose, you would give a prayer of thanks after every game, and you prayed on the field after every game for all the seven years you were there as coach. When and why did your praying on the field become a problem with the school board? Yeah, very interestingly enough, it actually came from a compliment that was received by one of the school administrators from another school administrator who saw what our football program was doing and called and gave a compliment of what we were doing was awesome. So that's how it all became about was, you know, somebody thinking what we were doing was great. Unbelievable. Joe, uh, according to reports, the school district instructed you that you could pray so long as you were not leading your players in prayer, and you complied with that request. But then the school district issued a new policy that said you could not pray where others might see you. How is that constitutional? That's the thing I, you know, I need, really needed to get legal help because, you know, I'm a high school football coach. I'm a former Marine. I, I know you know, what the Constitution says of the freedom of religion and freedom, you know, of speech, and then all of a sudden it doesn't apply to me. I, you know, if they want to stop me praying with students, hey, their school, their rules, it might be unfortunate, but I complied with everything. 
But when they said, I can no longer pray, and they took away my rights, that's where I, I just, you know, the Marine came out in me, and I, they had a fight on their hands. Yeah, well, it's not only a, a right to free speech, a right to practice religion, but also freedom of assembly. Jeremy, uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which sided with the school district, said that Coach Joe was engaging in, quote, public speech of an overtly religious nature, end quote, while on the job as a public employee. They added that the school district could have violated the Constitution by, quote, allowing the coach to pray at the conclusion of football games in the center of the field with students who felt pressured to join him. How can this be when the coach engaged in non-coerced private prayer, which he didn't lead the players in? Yeah, that's a question that the Supreme Court is going to have to answer here, because the implications of that decision are so wide-ranging that if a teacher were seen bowing her head in prayer over her lunch in the cafeteria by students, that would be an establishment of religion, according to the school district, and that teacher could be terminated for it. Or if the teacher wore a yarmulke or a hijab or a crucifix around her neck, those are all grounds for, uh, uh, for dismissal, because those are uh, overt, uh, uh, how did the court put it there? Overt displays of religion by the uh, the teachers here, and that's apparently forbidden by the school district. Well, of course, the, the First Amendment doesn't say that. Instead, the First Amendment protects okay. coaches like uh, Joe Kennedy to be able to take a knee in silent prayer for 15 or 20 seconds, which is exactly what he did and was fired for. What one administrator called a fleeting prayer uh, while he was at the 50-yard line. Uh, and if that's going to be allowed to stand, then the freedom of religion at this point, the free exercise thereof, really means very little in this country. No, I don't understand this case. I mean, uh, you know, if, if he wanted to stay there for a fleeting prayer for 10 seconds or an hour, that's nobody's business but his and those who decide to join him. Doesn't this violate, and I guess you all are arguing this, not only as a First Amendment uh, argument, but are you also including the freedom of assembly as well in that, in the religious rights and the free speech rights? We're, we're, we'll include everything that'll stick to the wall when we go to the Supreme Court of the United States, of course. But look, no one should be banned from praying just because they can be seen by students. And that's exactly what happened here. And I think it's really important for us to remember just how many times the school district here has has moved the goalposts. Coach Kennedy, all he's wanted from the very beginning was the opportunity to, to take one knee in silent prayer for 15, maybe 20 seconds, as if he was tying his shoes out on the 50-yard line, but he was praying. And they said, because they, he can be seen by students, well, that's an endorsement by the state of religion that was somehow unlawful. The only accommodation that they were willing to give was to say, hey, you could go run in the janitor's closet or up in the press box to have your prayer. But no one should have to hide their faith in the janitor's closet or uh, run up to the press box to be able to do that. Students are are able to understand that that's Coach Kennedy praying, that's Joe Kennedy himself out there praying, and understand that the First Amendment actually protects that right to be able to do that very thing. No one should be banned from praying in public. Yeah. Well, this case was rejected by the Supreme Court in 2019, although Justice Sam Alito wrote at the time, quote, the Ninth Circuit's understanding of the free speech rights of public school teachers is troubling and may justify review in the future. What is perhaps most troubling is the Ninth Circuit's opinion is language that can be understood to mean that a coach's duty to serve as a good role model requires the coach to refrain from any manifestation of religious faith, even when the coach is plainly not on duty. Uh, coach Joe, your thoughts when you read that, and uh, I, I can only imagine that you're uplifted that the Supreme Court is at least reviewing this case. Oh, absolutely. The It, it was amazing that, you know, the, what the lower court said, and I, I mean, if any of my players will ever see me and being a good role model, I don't know why thanking, you know, God or, you know, thanking anybody for what they did out in the football field is somehow, you know, a, a bad role model. And it doesn't stop after the football field. I, you know, I go to church, you know, I pray before my meals when my family and I go out to, um, mm -hmm. you know, a restaurant. So am I going to be banned from actually praying anywhere in a public? It, I, I can't understand any of it, and I'm just so blessed that the Supreme Court actually took a look at this because uh, I, I'm I'm like you I'm absolutely boggled by this and I don't understand yeah. the law but it's it's it seems really silly to me.
Yeah, no, no. It seems punitive and targeted at you. I mean, does this mean any public official has to refrain from grace before meals in public because it might be seen as a public endorsement of religion? I mean, this is none of this follow. This is crazy. Uh, Jeremy, uh, why do you think the Supreme Court decided to review it at this time? Well, I, I think they saw what they needed to see when we brought back more information to them this time. And look, things just got worse. You read from the first Ninth Circuit opinion, the second Ninth Circuit opinion here, especially Judge Smith's Smith's opinion in that that case uh, in the, the the dismissal for on bonk reasons. Hey, he he said that not only is Coach Joe, uh, you know, trying to just put on a show here by by engaging in prayer, which is the last thing he was attempting to accomplish. He said at the very end that uh, Coach Joe was not following the instructions of the Sermon on the, on the Mount, and, and he was effectively a bad Christian And on top of all this. That's a federal judge trying to sit in judgment of how Coach Kennedy practices his faith. Well, that's precisely why we have First Amendment, so that federal judges are never sitting in judgment over someone's free exercise of religion. Right. If promise in Tinker v. Des Moines means anything, that neither students nor teachers shed their constitutional rights when they walk through the schoolhouse gates, it has to mean that he can take a knee in silent prayer by himself for 15 or 20 seconds after a football game. To say otherwise, devoids or uh, empties the, the First Amendment of all meaning. Yeah. Following the announcement that the Supreme Court would be hearing your case, Coach Joe, uh, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State CEO Rachel Laser, representing the school districts, released this statement. No child attending public school should have to pray to play school sports. The lower courts have repeatedly ruled in the school district's favor, and the Supreme Court should likewise recognize that the Bremerton School District did the right thing to protect the religious freedom and ultimately the safety of children, end quote. Joe, did you ever force your players to pray or give preferential treatment to those players? You know, I, I, I'm in agreement with them. If I force my players to pray to play, I should have been fired. Anybody, anybody forcing somebody to exercise faith of any kind or, or banning them, you know, it's just as bad. The whole idea that hmm. I would ever do that. I've had players that were non-believers and approached me. Well, guess what? Those are the guys that are leading my team. Those are my team captains because they, they're they not afraid to stand up for what they believe in. But, you know, hmm. praying to play is just the most ridiculous thing. And I got like 400 kids that I coached over the years. Find somebody who would ever say anything like that. It's That's absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, what do you make of Rachel Laser's statement that the Bremerton School District protected religious freedom and the safety of children, and the Supreme Court should follow the lower court rulings? Was the safety of children ever in question in this case? This is absolutely backwards, what she's been saying all along here, because the facts just simply don't comport with reality that as she presents them. The reality is this, that Coach Kennedy, from the very beginning, has just sought one thing, and that was to take a knee in silent prayer by himself. He's done absolutely everything he can to avoid a lawsuit. It was only because Bremerton uh, High, uh, School District continued to move the goalposts in this game, uh, in this issue, that we're at the Supreme Court of the United States. At any moment, they could have restored this and just simply accommodated him for 15 or 20 seconds on a knee in silent prayer at the 50-yard line by himself. It's important to well, remember yeah. when they said, hey, you can't play with, pray with the kids. He said, absolutely, I get it. Those are your rules, and I understand. And he stopped, mm -hmm. and the school district complimented him for stopping. Uh, they only terminated yeah, well, him when he was unwilling to bend his on his we, commitment. We, we shouldn't be, yeah, we, 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 you protect children's religious freedom by giving them the freedom to exercise their faith, not segregating them and marginalizing them from any religious expression or practice. That is not well protecting kids' <laughs> religious freedom. Sorry. Uh, Coach Joe, the Supreme Court will hear oral arguments uh, for the case in the spring. What do you hope will be the result of that, and how do you think this case will affect others who feel they can't publicly demonstrate their faith for fear of being fired or sidelined? Well, initially, you know, the, the first and for, foremost is, you know, be able to coach again, to be back on the football field and just mm -hmm. having, you know, the ability to be a coach. Second is to be able to thank God for doing that, giving me that opportunity. So when it comes up this spring, uh, you know, I'm just I'm just happy they're going to hear it and the religious freedom of all Americans. I don't care what faith you are, but that should be protected and, and nobody should be told mm -hmm. that you have to pray a certain way and you will lose your job if you, if you have any kind of faith. That's just wrong in America.
Yeah. Coach, where do you want to where do you want to coach uh, when when this is all over? Do you want to return to oh, Bremerton? Well, well, absolutely. Bremerton is, I, you know, I if I ever received a job offer from anywhere else, it, it would be, you know, it, that's not even an issue. It's all about Bremerton. I, me and my family, all my kids went there. I went there. Uh, we've all worked at the school district, so it's it's really important to give back to our, you know, mm. community where we grew up. Coach Joseph Kennedy, Jeremy Dice, I thank you both for being here, and we will keep our eyes on this case. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And just this week, Sean Payton announced his retirement as head coach of the New Orleans Saints. His timing could be ideal, given a new Netflix film that arrives on the streamer Friday, January 28th. Home Team is based on Sean Payton. It occurs two years after he won Super Bowl 44 with the Saints, and Payton was suspended for a year by the NFL for what became known as Bounty Gate. Members of the team were accused of paying out bounties for injuring opposing players. Now, during that suspension, Payton returns to his hometown in Texas and reconnects with his 12-year-old son by helping coach his son's football team. It is a story of family and redemption, starring Kevin James as Peyton and Taylor Lautner as coach Troy Lambert. Here's a clip of the film. I want all you D-backs to drop into coverage, okay? Yeah. Actually, not, not all of you. We're gonna blitz. Linebacker blitz? Safety blitz. From the right? From the left. Weak side safety blitz. You heard, yeah, I mean, weak side safety blitz, all right, guys? Let's go, let's go get them. Kevin and Taylor, thanks for being with us. How much did you research Sean Payton, the man, Kevin? I mean, were you watching game films and reading articles? How did you prepare? Well, the, the, the project came from Sandler, from Adam uh, Sandler. So he was the one who brought it to me. And once it was a go, uh, you know, one of the great things that comes with Adam is, you know, access to everything. He knows everybody. He knows, you know, he, he's the one who got Taylor. He got me to, to interviews with Sean and to talk to him and to meet his family. And uh, his, his, his brother-in-law is the one who wrote the movie, Chris Tatone. I was able to get in there and, 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 and meet him and, and talk to him and, and learn as much as I could to prepare myself for this movie. So it was really a great experience. Kevin, did Sean Payton consult on the film? How much contact did you have with him while shooting? He, he was like, you guys do your thing. And he was like, have fun. But he's like, he was also helping out. And if you need anything, and here's what I would do here. And I'm, you know, I was asking him stuff. And how would you guide this and that? Or how would you say this? And he, he's fantastic. Kevin, how did you balance the serious side of Peyton's story, the suspension, with the heartwarming and often funny story of Sean reconnecting with his son by helping coach the team? I mean, you really extend your dramatic range here while keeping things funny. The suspension was just a catalyst, really. We don't, we don't focus on that. It's, it's more about this story is about the reconnection between a father and a son and uh, how, you know, he took something that was, you know, a, a downtime in his life and turned it into something much greater. And it turned out to be the, the, the greatest season of football in his life. D Taylor, this was not your first experience with the New Orleans Saints. You were already a fan and you had met Peyton before. Tell me about that. Um, yeah, I met Sean uh, in, I think it was 2010 or 11, when we were filming the final two Twilight movies in Baton Rouge. Um, he, he reached out and invited me to a game. Um, and he put me on the sidelines, gave me my own headphones. I was listening to him call plays hit between him and Drew Brees. Um, and then we just, you know, became friends. I started going back to almost all the home games. It's just a, a really cool full circle story that I was truly honored to be a part of. Okay, Kevin, then Taylor. What do you hope people will take away from the film? In life, when, when, when things don't go as well and you can turn opportunities, you know, it, it, the other doors are opened and it, it does present opportunity and to take that sometimes. And, you know, sometimes in our own life, you know, we, we need to, to stop the spinning wheel and the craziness of everything that's going on and just uh, take a minute of pause and wait and, and reconnect with our family and try, just kind of go through what, what really is important. The, the important things in life, I think this, this movie 
who reminds us, you know, that sometimes we need to take a step back and a break from whatever is occupying our brain and our daily lives and just take mm -hmm. a step back and reader and, you know, mm -hmm. appreciate the, the wonderful things that we have. Thank you, gents. Home Team, starring Kevin James and Taylor Lautner, is available on Netflix Friday, January 28th. Thank you both. That is all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.